Friday. It looks like we're ready to begin. Again, my name is Tom Wilder. Welcome again to Fall Protection Webinar. And I'll, of course, be your instructor today. For those of you who do not already know me, I have more than five years experience with the Department of Labor. And prior to that, I worked 28 years in various safety training and quality management positions in the textile machine assembly and pharmaceutical industries. Most of those years were in pharmaceutical manufacturing from which I am now retired. Like I said, that's just a little bit about me. Uh, today's webinar, we're scheduled for one and a half hours. So regardless of, regardless of length, you'll receive one and a half hours credit, which you can use for obtaining or maintaining EHS certifications such as your MESH certification. And just a couple of minutes for logistics. Go around, look around your work area, try to limit any distractions. If you have an office, you want to close your door, turn phones off. If you're in a cube, use headphones and put up a do not disturb note. And again, we're using WebinAuto today. A lot of you are on our webinars routinely. You know about it. But for those of you that are new, you'll see the PowerPoint slides in the center. I'll advance those as we go. On the bottom of the screen, you'll in the left corner, you'll see an emoji. Uh, I will not use that feature today, so don't worry about the emoji. And at the bottom, you see a chat box, and a lot of you have already used the chat box to say good morning, whatever. And uh, you'll make your, uh, put your questions or comments in the chat box. And thirdly, you must attend at least 80% of the time today to receive credit. And I'll be looking at your login and duration times after we're finished today. And we can't give credit to anyone who's not registered and logged in. So if you have multiple people around you, uh, you'll be the only one receiving credit if you're registered. All the other folks will not. Uh, certificates are processed once every month, and you should receive them electronically within three weeks. If you do not get a certificate, uh, call us and let us know. So again, today we're covering fall protection and construction. And um, hold on a second. As you know, uh, fall protection is important because uh, one of the leading causes of fatalities in North Carolina is falls. Um, in the last fiscal year, we had um, 12 uh, construction fatalities. We had five from falls, four for struck by, two for caught in, and one electrical. So falls were almost half of the uh, fatalities in construction. But of course, it does not include all the other significant injuries caused by falls. Uh, we're going to be talking about the requirements and controls to prevent falls. But as you know, employee behavior is key, as we must rely on employees following procedures, using maintaining equipment, and understanding fall hazards. Now, the topic today is for construction activities and construction companies but the basic principles also apply to general industry. Now, if you're in general industry, typically, and you're not normally in construction, uh, we have a new walking, working surfaces standard. So a lot of you will essentially fall into that uh, most of the time. But when you're performing construction, uh, we'll be talking about the regulation related to construction activities. Now, I want to take a couple of minutes to do what I like to do and do a couple of instant polls. And first of all, I would like to ask about your experience level with this topic. And I want to share the results and start this poll. So what is your experience level with this topic? Uh, of course, all of us trainers like to know the experience of our trainees so that we can go to the appropriate level with our training. So as you might expect, we have a pretty good mix. Uh, we had 34 people registered. Right now, I only have 15 online. So I've got uh, 10 of you that have responded. And we have four beginners, four intermediate, and two advanced folks with, the, um, with this particular topic. Now I'm going to go ahead and stop that poll and close it. And let me go ahead and ask my other question, which is professional safety experience. And let's start that, that poll. I like to know how experienced my class is. 
And like I said, we have now 16 logged on out of 34 registered. Hopefully we'll have some more people join in with us in just a minute. So professional safety experience, I have several that, uh, that have over 10 years, super veterans, and we have other one vet veteran from five to 10, four from one to five, and a couple of people that are just starting out as a safety professional. So again, we have a good mix. So today in the class, uh, some of you may learn one or two things. Some of you may learn a lot. But I'm going to teach to, to the lowest level because for our beginners, we want to make sure that they understand the requirements for fall protection. So let's go ahead and close that poll. So I'm going to stop it and close it. And one thing I'm going to do right now is something that's not going to work for everyone. Uh, because of the equipment you're using, because your computers or devices you're using, some of you may or may not see this video that I'm going to get ready to show or hear the video. So you may see and hear the video. You may just hear it or you may just see it, depending on your equipment at your end. And I'm hoping that most of you are going to see this video. So I want to show a short video that talks about the importance of behavior with fall protection and construction. So let me go ahead and get that video going. This one is titled Fall Protection Can Save Your Life and this is from WorkSafe BC. This is actually a Canadian video. You don't get it. That truck's moving with me through everything. Everything what? A million 3 a.m. trips to 7-Eleven? You have no idea what can happen at 7-Eleven in the middle of the night. I don't even want to know. Yeah, that's because after 27, you turn 60. It's called being an adult, Derek. Whatever. Thanks for the lift, man. I think my truck's hooped. Well, time to replace that thing. It's an embarrassment. You know it's an embarrassment. That shirt's an embarrassment. This shirt? This shirt is awesome. Who told you that, your mom? No. You know it's not awesome? I left my harness back in my truck. You wanna go back and get it? No, I'm good. We gotta get this done. You sure? Yeah, let's get to it. Thanks for the lift, man. I think that truck is hooped. About time you replace that thing. It's an embarrassment. You know, it's an embarrassment. That shirt's an embarrassment. This shirt? This shirt is awesome. You know it's not awesome? I left my harness back in my truck. You wanna go back and get it? Yeah, I should. All right. Help me unload first, though. Okay, I'm back to my slides. Um, let me know. Uh, let me know if you were able to see and hear that video. Did anybody have any issues? Let me know if you were able to see the video or hear it. I'm hopefully most of you. Good, good. Now it seems like uh, a lot of times on these webinars, some people may or not may not be able to see or hear these videos. So we like to show them. Well, I'm glad. Okay, Ricky could not. It looks like most of you could. So apologize for those of you who could not. Um, 
and it must be a technical issue at your end. Thanks for standing by. <clears throat> now, for those of you um, who were able to see the video I just showed, what did the video not show? Okay, we, you saw how the video ended, but what did the video not show? What did we not see? Of course, we didn't see him land because he, right. Sam, you're right. Uh, of course, we didn't see him dying. He was arrested in his fall. But uh, one thing that's very important today, if you don't learn anything else, is uh, pre-planning rescue and how long they can safely hang there. Uh, that's very dangerous. Uh, the good news is at this point, the person's fallen off the edge. He's been arrested by the harness, and he's, he's hanging there. But I'm going to spend a bit of time later on talking about uh, pre-planning rescue because it's very important. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started with the slides here. Of course, we're talking about fall protection and construction activities. And we're going to talk about, of course, fall protection, the requirements and the standard, and applying the fall protection standards to construction sites and to construction activities. You could be a general industry like a factory, uh, but you start performing construction activities, uh, then you would fall under the construction standard. And a, a lot of our audience today is general industry versus construction. So it depends on what activities you're performing. So if you're performing construction activities, uh, then of course this topic directly applies to you. Uh, this is 2015 data. It just uh, shows in 2015 of all the fatalities in that fiscal year that um, almost a third of those fatalities in North Carolina were caused by falls. Now, uh, with this topic, you'll notice in the OSHA standards, there are other standards that get into other requirements. So when you're talking about fall protection, you also want to look at scaffold, steel, steel erection, tunneling, power transmission, stairways and ladders, cranes and derricks, and communication towers. So uh, you're going to learn the requirements in the construction standard for fall protection. But if you're involved in these activities, you're also going to be looking at the requirements there as well. Now, uh, one thing that some or all of you may already know, in construction, uh, this standard does not apply when employees are making an inspection, investigation, or assessment of conditions prior to the start of construction or after the work is completed. So let's say you're a uh, roofer or you're working with a roofing company. Um, somebody's putting a new roof on their house and they're sending somebody up to estimate the roof or look at damage or whatever. So there's a point where the worker is not required to be wearing fall protection during the inspection before work begins or after work is completed. Now, one thing we must note here, that doesn't mean there's no hazard for that person. It's just the OSHA standard does not require them to be connected or tied off or use railing or nets when they're doing that. So those are exceptions to the rule. Uh, but again, they, they also need to be very careful because they're not using fall protection. Uh, one thing that you probably already know when you look at residential construction, in 1969, the roof pitches weren't nearly as steep. They were a lot more flat in general. So you, the peaks were shorter and the drip edges were, were lower. So somebody's involved in a fall, uh, they may or may not go off the roof or they may not fall as, much, as far. But in 2008, typically you can see the, the height of the drip edge and the peaks went up tremendously. Uh, a lot of you, your homes, if they're relatively new, uh, the roofs are quite dangerous because uh, they're so steep. And if you're up there doing anything at all, if you start falling, there is no way to stop yourself. You just you end up coming off the roof. Now, uh, a lot of you already know that the fall distances are regulated 
uh, by OSHA differently for general industry and these other activities. If you're under the general industry standard, four foot is the regulated fall height. So if you have somebody working at four feet or above, uh, they, they need to be protected from falls. In construction, it's six feet. On scaffolds, it's 10 feet. I'll go ahead and ask you a question. What is 10 foot for a scaffold? What does that indicate? When you're constructing a scaffold, what is 10 feet? Okay, that is one story. But like with sections of scaffolds, how many sections? Okay, Joel, that's right. Two bucks. Actually, it's two bucks high. So that would be two. So it's two bucks high. So if you if you're looking at a scaffold and you see the cross, if it's a scaffold that uses particular cross bracing, you'll see two cross braces, and above that level, that person needs to be protected by railing or fall protection. So that would be scaffolds 10 feet, and steel erection is 15 feet. Just something to know. Now, um, if you're in construction, you need to provide fall protection to your employees. And also make sure that anywhere they work, any surface they work on, is strong enough for them to work on safely. Of course, hopefully that's common sense. And fall protection is required with all these activities, edges, hoist areas, holes, uh, formwork, ramps, excavations, uh, brick laying, roofs, concrete erection, residential construction, wall openings, and other walking and working surfaces. Now, dangerous equipment is listed there, and this is very important for you to know. Now, I showed you the, the distances where people need to be protected from falls. Uh, what is the what is the height requirement if you're working over dangerous equipment? This is a really good question. What, if you're working over dangerous equipment, general industry or construction, what is the height requirement for that requires fall protection? If you're over dangerous equipment. Okay, I've got a six foot answer, 10 foot answer, four foot. I'm still looking for the answer. It's kind of a trick question. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you the answer to that. If you're in a general industry or construction, there's no height requirement for dangerous equipment. What, that, what, what we mean is you got to be protected from falling into dangerous equipment at any height. So um, if there's no dangerous equipment below, but uh, there's a fall hazard, we're going to look at the heights that we looked at on that slide. But if you had um, dangerous equipment below, it had moving parts, gears, uh, chemicals, vats, uh, it wouldn't really matter how high up you were you would have to have railing or fall, fall protection to prevent you from falling into the moving equipment, into the chemical or whatever. So look at your work sites, look at what's dangerous equipment, and if, uh, don't think about the, the height there. You always have to prepare uh, for anybody possibly falling into dangerous equipment. So there's no height requirement on that. You always have to have fall protection when somebody could fall into dangerous equipment. Okay, so that's kind of an exception to the height requirement. Now, unprotected sides and edges. Now, our um, a lot of our photos today, you're going to see they're taken by compliance officers. So what's the issue with this photo? This is construction. What's the problem? Right. There's no, yeah, where do you start? That's right, Todd. Um, these, these folks are not protected from falls, period. 
Now, there are a number of ways that we could um, we could do that. What are the what are the, what are the ways that we could protect these two people from falls? What are our options? Okay, first they need to be trained. Okay, Colleen, that's a good answer. Okay, uh, fall arrest system. You talked about harnesses. So you put them in a harness and they're connected to keep them from falling uh, more than free falling more than six feet. So they can be in a fall arrest system. What else could we have? If, let's say they're not in a harness, they're not in fall. Uh, safety officer hmm, on flat roofs, you can do that. That section, I'm not sure. Now you could use a lift, that's a good answer. You could use uh, aerial lift. And uh, Colleen said netting, that's a great answer. Uh, you could have a safety net. Now you won't see safety nets much in this type of construction. You could have a net, a catch net. And what's the other thing they could have installed here temporarily? What could they have installed? Most likely not for this particular job, but what could they have put up? And I don't think anybody said it yet. Let's look and see. Nope. What could they install? Railing. That's right, Todd. Um, they could put uh, guardrails up. So guardrails, um, safety net, um, or a fall arrest system like a harness. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and um, okay. A scaffold. Okay. A scaffold is a good answer too. Now the scaffold. The scaffold is going to have to have fall protection if it's a, above 10 feet. This so it's a, if it's a proper scaffold, that's a good answer. Again, there's no fall protection here. Now these people. These people are doing leading edge work, and what they're doing is they're putting sheets of metal down to um, create a subfloor on this building that's being built. Now, uh, we expect fall protection for people doing leading edge work. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about leading edge work later. Hoist areas. Now, um, here's Here's a case where we have railing up. That's good. So um, there's no fall hazard here. Now, uh, let's just say that when you're building a building, uh, they have t uh, a section of rail they take out to bring materials into that level. If they have to uh, load a level and they have to take railing out, then uh, that person that's working that area to receive those materials need to be protected from falls. So uh, anytime you remove railing temporarily, then your worker that's uh, within six feet of that edge, they need to be protected from falls. Okay, holes and skylights. Uh, we've had several people nationally over the last few years die from falling through skylights. And what will happen is um, you'll have somebody working on a roof. They could be doing HVAC work or they could be doing roofing work, whatever. And uh, they take a break. Uh, a lot of times the folks get to take a break in the morning. So what would they tend to do if they didn't know better? A person taking a break working on a roof. Yeah, sit on the right, Colleen, sit on the window or sit on the skylight. Now, a lot of skylights are not engineered to sit on. And uh, what happens, a lot of these skylights anyway, is over the years, ultraviolet light from the sun, it makes them brittle. A UV light uh, will damage just about anything over time. And uh, so a person will take a break, they'll sit on the skylight, it will break. And they may fall 20, 30, 40 feet to their death uh, from that skylight. <clears throat> so 
what is required uh, for a skylight? What is required for a skylight? If I've got some, right, okay, you're going to either put some temporary guardrails up, or, like Todd says, you could have a cover. It could be like a um, open steel, an open, a very open steel mesh cover, uh, something that's engineered to protect people from falling through that skylight. Now there may be some skylights out there that look like they might be not be protected, but they're engineered to meet fall protection requirements. But anyway, um, if you have somebody working around a standard skylight that's not protected and not it does not meet protection standards, then it needs to be guarded. All right, uh, for, formwork and reinforcing steel. Now. Um, these guys here, they're, they're working on this building. Uh, they've got fall protection on. Now, uh, if you can see right here in front of this guy, what is that right there, right there in, mid in the middle of where I just circled? What is that person doing? I mean, besides working, what's, what's that little item? is right in here. What is that? Yeah? Okay. Okay, Todd, it is hard to see. Now, one thing I will tell you, uh, you can maximize these PowerPoint slides. There's a little box up there where you can make it bigger. So if you want to look at a picture and make it bigger, you can maximize. Above where my circle is, you should see a little box. Now, uh, when you maximize your screen, you're not going to be able to see your chat box, so you want to minimize it if you want to send me questions or comments. Okay, Sam, fall restraint. And what we're going to call that, that's positioning. That's a positioning strap or lanyard. And uh, so uh, he has a harness on that has a ring on the front, and uh, that can be used for positioning. So he can lean back and have both of his, his hands free, or her hands, I don't know if it's a woman or a man, um, to, to do their work. They need their hands to do the work, not to hold on to, to do their work. They need their hands to do the work, not to hold on. And um, they'll use a positioning strap. It'll be uh, connected to the ring on the front of their harness. So that's positioning. That's not fall protection, that's positioning. Now, uh, when you're wearing a harness, where is a person connected for fall arrest? Where do they connect on the harness? Not that front ring. Where does a person connect for fall arrest? Okay, back, rear. And that's on that D ring up there between his or her shoulders. Uh, that's where you'll connect for your fall protection. So. These people are using fall protection and positioning uh, lanyards as well. Ramps, runways, we need to protect people from falling there. Pretty, pretty obvious. Excavations. Now, if you're a company that uh, does a lot of trenching and excavating, if if the excavation is done in a way where it's not apparent, where somebody's just walking along and they fall into a trench, you need to put fall protection there to keep somebody from falling in. Now, uh, you're going to have to use a judgment call. depends on how apparent the excavation is. Is there, is there a chance any time, day or night, where somebody could be walking along and just fall in there? Now, OSHA is there to protect employees. But of course, we don't want anybody, any person, no matter who they are, falling into an excavation. So some may need uh, to have railing or, or something put temporarily to keep somebody away from that edge. <clears throat> now here's an excavation. This is an interesting one. There's a trench box in there. And uh, it's very unusual to see one quite like this. 
uh, trench box. They usually don't cut excavations this wide to put a trench box in there. But if, if they had to put it in this way, they'd have to have a way to keep that trench box from shifting because that, uh, that trench box is protecting a worker inside of there from a cave-in from that uh, excavation caving in onto the box. Uh, dangerous equipment we've already talked about. If you have a worker that's working above dangerous equipment, you have to protect them from falling into it, regardless of height. That will be one takeaway for you today. Remember, there's no particular height above uh, dangerous equipment. At any height above dangerous equipment, you have to protect people from falling into it. Overhead brick laying, again, uh, we want fall protection. This slide is not the best one for this example because these people, uh, these workers, um, they're not even up. They're not even up six feet yet. They're working on a scaffold. They're not even up six feet. But um, we'll talk a little bit more about overhand bricklaying layers. Okay, now let me stop and see if everybody's good to go. Or is everybody with me? Do we have any questions or comments at this time? Colleen's good. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Now this, um, hopefully, this presentation is not very confusing and uh, not, not very hard to understand. Um, but when we talk about low slope roofs, we're talking about four 12 pitch and steep roofs. We're talking about greater than four 12 pitch. So uh, like say low slope, for uh, every four feet you go up, you go across 12. In other words, it's not as, uh, that's rise over run. Uh, it's just the steepness of the roof. And you, the regs will talk about low and high pitch uh, surfaces. Residential construction. Okay, in this photo here, who do you think took these, this picture? Who do you think took this picture? or photo. Okay, it could be the supervisor. But since we're with the Department of Labor, Colleen's got it right, a compliance officer took that picture. So if a compliance officer, uh, yeah, it could be the owner of the home, but since it's coming from us, we have lots of good pictures that compliance takes. So you've got a compliance officer driving down the road. They're looking over there going, okay, there's a house under construction. And then they, then they say, oh my gosh, we've got problems here. What's the problem? I mean, there's several. I see some. I see some of you are typing. What is, what is the problem here? Okay, it's messy housekeeping, no fall protection, no protection from working dollars. Okay, improper, no harness use. Great. So uh, what's happening is you have a compliance officer driving up, stopping their vehicle, and these guys are going, oh my gosh. And they're all looking over and going, there's, a, there's a, a man or a woman over there taking our picture. And they're driving a vehicle with a yellow tag on it, a North Carolina state-owned vehicle. I wonder who they are. <laughs> and what it is, is this compliance officer taking a picture, and then they're going to go over there and open an inspection. Because this is a serious hazard. It could lead to a fatality if these workers keep working this way. So compliance takes a photo and then goes over there and opens an inspection. Okay, now these, these people are not, you see they're not using fall protection. Uh, what, about, what about some of these windows? Uh, what's the problem with the windows? 
that are that are high up. What does a window require when it's open like that? These, this is real easy to see. Okay, the window does not require a roof. Guards, that's right, Angela. So typically, what do you see from the road there in an open window of a, a proper house under construction? What do they have across that opening? It's a guard. They'll have they'll have a two by four. That's right, Todd. At the proper height for guarding, they'll have a two by four going across that opening. So somebody working inside that house can't fall out that window. And if you got somebody in construction and they're facing the other way and they're backing up, they could fall out of a window and not even realize it. Or it could be a big open hole, like Angela says, or any opening where somebody can fall. So we see issues here. These folks are not wearing hard hat, or well, not wearing harnesses or fall protection. There's no netting, there's no railing, uh, there's no guarding on some of the particular windows. And uh, I can't tell this person down here, I can't tell whether he's wearing a hard hat or not. So if, there, if there's overhead hazards, they need to be wearing hard hats as well, or helmets. Okay, now we just talked about uh, wall openings. Now here are some that aren't guarded. Okay, Todd says homemade ladder. Let's go back. I can't tell. There could be a homemade ladder there. So I... That portage on, uh, it could be a homemade ladder. <clears throat> now, I'm glad Todd brought that up. It could be a homemade ladder. And a lot of times, some of these homemade ladders that are thrown together are a hazard. They don't meet specifications. Now, uh, OSHA do does allow a company to build a ladder out of wood, but the specifications are so tight, and it's going to cost you so much to build a homemade ladder that most of the time they're going to be purchased. But if this is a ladder that's just thrown together, that would be an issue too. That's a good eye, Todd. I, that could be a homemade ladder in there. Now, we talked about the, uh, like I said, the two by fours, the guards going across these openings to prevent people from falling out. Now, um, again, like we just uh, talked about, if you have employees on a site where there's overhead hazards, like a construction site, they've got to wear a hard hat. And it's right out of the standard. Now, um, what is a hard hat also called in the standard? Now, this standard, it says hard hat. Uh, OSHA standards also refer to hard hats as what? What's another term for hard hat in the OSHA standard? Okay, it could say head protection, but the actual hard hat, they will call it a helmet. That's right, Colleen. It's a protective helmet. So if you see protective helmet or hard hat, that means the same thing. It's a hard hat. Okay, now, when you get on construction site or when you're performing construction and you got railing up, you're going to have to put tow board screens or guardrail systems up. Now, the tow boards are going to be when there's a chance of materials being kicked over the edge. Uh, you might have a canopy uh, to protect people below from falling objects. And if you're not protecting people from anything falling, you're going to barricade all the areas below to keep people from being hit by falling materials. Now, falling materials on a construction site can be very deadly. Um, there's a video, I've seen a video recently where they uh, dropped, they dropped heavy bolts, wrenches, tools from uh, construction elevations. They dropped them into watermelons and it showed what it did to watermelon, which would simulate your head. And they also, on some, in some cases, dropped uh, those items onto hard hats or helmets. Now, hard hats or helmets will not protect you from everything, 
that hopefully it will save your life. But I mean, there's certain materials, when, if you've got a helmet on, it, it may or may not save, save your life. But it's our first step to protect you is that helmet. Now, if you're uh, putting up guardrails, here are the dimensions. Top rail, 42 plus or minus 3. Mid rails, half of that. And your tow board is typically a quarter inch off the bottom to allow for drainage. And it's three and a half inches. That, so that's typically like a two by four, a four inch board in construction. Is, is, it's actually three and a half inches if you measured it. So a four inch board in construction is really 3.5. So if you're buying lumber, a two by four is not, not two by four if you measure it. So that's why that is three and a half inches. Uh, tow boards must take at least 50 pounds cross force. Uh, guard rails, 200 pounds. Um, now, a guard rail will not, it keeps people from falling off. But I want you to know that if you ran into a guard, if you ran into a guard rail, if you're running and ran into it, uh, it would probably give way. It's not made to withstand every possible force possible, like if a worker was running hard into it. Uh, if, they're, if they're big and heavy, it's probably not going to stop them. But it's going to pr protect somebody from normally falling, but it's, it can't stop everything. Now, conventional fall protection, we've already mentioned, are safety nets. Typically, safety nets are used uh, under bridge construction. So if you see these bridges being built, uh, a lot of times you'll see safety nets. Uh, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, when it was built way before OSHA came out, it came into being. Uh, they put a, the biggest safety net ever made under the Golden Gate Bridge when it was built as a safety measure. And that was not required by the government, but the owner of the project wanted to protect his people and uh, People were so happy that they put a safety net under that bridge that the project came in ahead of schedule. Uh, you know, it was protecting the workers. The quality of the work was great. And the safety net, the workers were so happy they had a net that well, the workers would jump into the actual net on the project for fun. Now, we don't want people to do that, but. Uh, that's one of the first safety nets that was ever used in construction was the Golden Gate, Golden Gate Bridge, which is quite old and way older than OSHA. Guardrails, uh, we've talked about standard guardrails, and then personal fall arrest systems. Now over there to the right, this is a harness, and it's being hung up by its D-ring. Again, we uh, safety nets are used with bridge construction and sometimes demolition of multi-story buildings or construction of uh, commercial buildings, rarely used in residential construction. And your guardrails, again, they're your uh, dimensions and specs for that. Now, I just want to let you know this, uh, this presentation is available on our website. So if you go to our website, you can download this presentation. I didn't already mention that. And if you scroll to the, uh, the first of the chat, I've got the actual link to the presentation. Okay, personal fall arrest systems. Now, this worker uh, is connected. Uh, he, uh, work, he's, he's working safely. Now, what you didn't see below him is uh, there's either, he's either on top of a truck or a rail car. I didn't take this picture, but uh, that's the case with a truck or a rail car. And they have to have some way to tie off. And uh, with this person's doing work on a truck or a rail car, uh, that particular area, they've got proper, um, proper setup here. Okay, is this correct? And if it's not, tell me what's wrong. What's wrong with this picture? Okay, it's not tied off. That's exactly right. Okay, what else? 
He's not tied to anything, Michael. That's a good comment. What is he tied to? Nothing. Okay, the ladder is not set correctly. The ladder angle may not be correct. It may not be 75 degrees. And how high does that ladder have to come up above that edge? How high? Okay, three. it's actually three feet. And when you uh, train people on ladder safety for construction or even general industry, uh, when you're going up to another level and going across an edge, you want it to be three feet above the edge. Now, the way to tell that is to count the rungs above the edge. And if you don't see three rungs, it's not three feet. Now, what that, what that is for is when that person gets to the top of the ladder, they need to hold on to something so that they can get off the ladder. If that ladder only went to the edge, the person would have nothing to, to hold on to as they try to step off onto the roof. So uh, uh, that would be a citation for ladder, probably ladder setup angle. The person's not tied off. And uh, what about those windows? Could those be an issue, maybe? The way those windows are right now? What do you think about those windows? Right, no guards. Now, the only way to really know is to go inside there and depends on how high that bottom, the bottom of that window is. If it's, if it's high enough, if that was 42 inches, that would be okay. But uh, if you're going to leave those windows open like that, uh, you need to have a way to keep people from falling out of those windows in construction. Okay. Now, whoop, skipped ahead a little bit too much. All right, uh, this is the rating, rating requirements of our, our devices, the 5,000 pound rating. If you have uh, somebody in a fall arrest system, it has to be designed so that they can't free fall more than six feet or contact any lower level. And if, if the lanyard has a, a decelerization pack in it to absorb the shock, that can't expand more than three and a half feet. Now, let's say, let's say you're a construction company and you're going to have a worker work at height and you're going to put a, a harness, a lanyard, and have them connect to an anchor point say it could be on a roof uh, what's the first thing what's the first thing you're gonna do what's that worker got to do first thing okay they're gonna inspect Daniel I'm gonna get to your comment here in a, a section in, in, here in a minute okay you're gonna you're gonna inspect all your equipment prior to use, and they've done a lot of studies where uh, people weren't inspecting their harnesses and they had damage. They had been involved in a fall. They had been worn. They had been cut. Uh, so that of course you can't use that, or uh, their anchor point's not sufficient. They're tied off to a roof vent, something that can't take a 5,000 pound force. Uh, that's a problem. Now, um, now, okay, your worker's been trained in their fall protection equipment. They got to be trained to use their equipment. They got to be trained to inspect it. Uh, they got to be trained on how to, again, properly use their equipment. Now, the construction company sends somebody up there to work. They have a fall arrest system. They've got that person in a harness, a six-foot lanyard with a, a decel pack on it. They're connected to a proper anchor. What's the one thing that a lot of companies do not do? What do they not plan for? This on the slide. What do they rescue? That's right, Todd. Almost, we we find this all the time. 
okay, if this person falls, how are you going to get them down? Okay. Um, now, the, after we talk about this for a minute, hopefully you're going to take this very seriously. Um, now, um, if you got a person hanging there in a in a harness, how long how long can they safely hang up there before somebody gets them down? Okay. Okay. Joel, ten minutes. Okay, we're getting a lot of different answers. Now, uh, Joel, I'm glad you gave me that answer. Uh, if you let somebody hang, and you may be doing this just to get me to comment. If you if you have somebody hang an hour, uh, what's the likely outcome? They're hanging an hour. That's right, Angela. I, I, I almost guarantee you they're going to be dead. They're going to be dead. So uh, the, the standard talks about prompt rescue. So we're going to try to define prompt. Now I've done a lot of studies. Uh, and I'm going to, now a lot of this stuff is not in the OSHA standard. These are based on studies. Anything more than four, five, or six minutes, and you're risking irreversible health effects. This is based on studies. So uh, four, five, six minutes. That's not much time. So you can't wait for somebody to fall, and then by the time, by the time you get them down, they can have irreversible health effects. Now. Um, 30 minutes, uh, I guarantee you 30 minutes, you better have them down in 30 minutes, but I would not use 30 minutes as a rule. Um, if I'm a company, I'm, I'm trying to get somebody down in five minutes or less, and that's extremely fast, five minutes. Um, that person... If that person hangs up there five minutes, uh, what 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 could happen at the five to ten minute mark? Which what can you expect to happen to that person at the five to ten minute mark? Okay, now they're they're gonna okay pass out. That's what I'm looking for. Great answer. Pass out. Your body's your body's automatically going to force that body to pass out. Now, um, and right, Todd says many first responders are not equipped for those type of high, high rescues. Your body, if you hang for so long, your body with the lack of blood in your upper body, uh, your body's going to automatically pass out. Now, if a person's standing out and they faint, that's your body trying to recover. It's your body trying to fall down and recover blood to the brain to get everything on the same level because most of the blood after a fall is in the lower body, which is the case most of the time anyway. But if you have, you know, up to, say, 2,000 pounds of force from that fall arrest and you've got those straps cutting off circulation coming up, and you've got one-way valves sending blood to, to, to the top of the body, and, the, and those are depending on the, the muscles in the legs to help pump that blood up. Uh, your brain, your brain's not getting much oxygen. It's not being reoxygenated. It's passing out. The upper body is trying to force more blood up. It's not getting it, and uh, it's going to cause a person to faint. Now, um, now I want to look at our comments. Okay, I want to go back to Daniel's comment. PPE requirements are set by the employer. A hard hat's not requirement list. Okay, now this has nothing to do with what I'm talking about now, but I'll go ahead and uh, comment on your comment. 
Uh, PPE requirements for OSHA is that if you have if you have an overhead hazard falling materials, you're going to have a hard hat on. Uh, the employers can require them all the time. OSHA requires it when the, when the hazards around. Now, um, all your different answers here on rescue. Uh, you're trying your very best to rescue in three to six minutes. Uh, your uh, EMS, if you call EMS 911, your response time, I'm going to say most of the time, is not going to be fast enough. Now, um, now Joel says, if this case is, this is the case, it's six people I've taken down are the luckiest people in the world. Okay, Joel. So how, how long did they hang there? Did they hang for a whole hour? Wow. Well, I I can't I can't really explain that. But um, if you do the rating and studies that I've done, um, you can't you can't risk that. Now, now we've got some good questions coming in, and I know we're taking a lot of time on this rescue, but we should. Now, <clears throat> if you're in a harness and you fall off the edge, what do you, what do you, what should you try to do? Let's just say, um, uh, what are you going to try to do unless you're uh, unconscious, bleeding, or whatever? What should you try to do? Now, you're going to be upright, but most of that blood's going to be in your lower body. And that force of the, of the rest has forced most of your blood into your legs and your lower body. We've got to get that blood up. Okay, Angela, that's a great answer. Now, um, what people can do uh, when they're trained on harnesses they need to practice uh, going from a upright position into a sitting position. So you can, if you if you have the skill, you can pull up and reposition yourself in the harness where you're you're sitting. Now what you'll have to do, uh, this this takes some training, is you have to try to loop your foot around that lifeline. To kind of pull that body up and shift that harness down so you can sit out, so you can get those keep those legs moving and get circulation. Now, uh, you talked about uh, here talking about padded harness. Uh, you talked about uh, here talking about padded harnesses. Now it is it is good to have great harnesses, but some of the studies I've seen said that the, the padding helped make them more comfortable. But when you're talking about 1,800 to 2,000 pounds or more force on your body, uh, you're, you're still forcing all that blood down. You're still cutting off the circulation. Now, what, what is a simple device that you can add to a harness to make it much more safe in that case? What can you add to a harness? A tuyere. I'm not familiar with that term, but uh, what you can, okay? What what the vendors will call them is their relief straps. Okay, I'll, I'll just type it in here. Uh, A relief strap or stirrup. <clears throat> you can buy these for any harness. They'll connect to your harness. Somebody's in a fall. They deploy the, the relief strap or stirrup. And what that does, it drops a strap down, which has a place for your foot to go. Now, you can just put one on a harness and put both feet on them, or you can put one on either side. They drop down, and you put both feet in them, and then you can stand up in these stirrups. 
And what that does, it takes the pressure off the crotch or where those uh, straps of your harness are going and allows your blood to be able to circulate better. And then what you're going to try to do is work your legs. You're going to exercise your legs back and forth, back and forth. And what that does, the muscles in the legs will force that blood up the veins, which have one-way valves, and it's going to force that blood back into the body, try to get that blood back up into the upper body. And it's going to increase the chances of a safe recovery of that victim tr tremendously. So if you're involved in a fall, you need to get that that body into a sitting position somehow, and uh, either with relief straps or some way, so you don't hang there very long. Uh, I'm saying now, do not let, uh, like I said, studies have shown you're, you're rolling the dice more than four, five, or six minutes. It depends on the fall, the fall distance, the forces. It depends on a lot of stuff. But just don't let that person hang there. Now, what can they, what can they uh, company also buy for the person that's hanging there pre-planned? Could a person hanging there ever do a self-rescue? Yes, that's right, Sam. Uh, you can, depending on your company, you can buy equipment that will allow, allow the person to self-rescue. So, uh, but the main thing is pre-plan for prompt rescue. Don't depend on EMS. Um, I'm targeting, I'm saying five minutes, get them down. Uh, I've got too not much reading, and, and Joel, I know for some reason you got some people that are like miracles that survived, but something tells me there's something I don't know that they did that enhanced their chances, but don't ever let people hang for very long because we got too many cases. If you see the studies of fatalities and, and falls, that, that show that a lot of people didn't hang very long and then they eventually died. <clears throat> okay, now, um, let's say, okay, you're rescuing somebody and you get them down to the ground or to a flat surface, wherever. What is the one thing you do not want to do with them? This is one thing that's kill, also killing people. What position should they not be in? Well, they shouldn't be standing up. That's good. Good answer. We don't want them standing because we're trying to get the bloods in the in the lower part of their body. We don't want them standing. Okay. Now. One thing I'm going to tell you right now, and this is not an OSHA standard, go ahead and do your homework later if you want to, but do not lay them flat, whether they're on their side, whether they're on their back, do not lay them flat. Because when you're standing anyway as a person, a good majority of your blood's going to be in your lower part of your body. Now, the force of that fall is it forced most of the blood down there, a great deal of that blood. The blood's not been circulating. Uh, acids have been developing in the body and been picked up by the blood down there. It's deoxygenated. Now, if you lay somebody down, uh, the, the acidic blood and the rush of the blood to the heart uh, can cause cardiac arrest. Also, the, the acidic blood can damage the heart and the kidneys. So um, that, that blood is, while it's been not circulating, it's been picking up and developing toxins. And uh, you lay somebody down, you're gonna ru that's going to be a rush of blood to the heart. That could kill them. Now what you're going to do is sit them like in a W position. They're going to be sitting up with their knees up. And we're going to gradually try to get that blood flow normal again, but we don't want to rush the blood to the heart. We, we want them recovering a W position. 
and um, uh, they say keep them there for about 30 minutes. Now, of course, EMS should be there at that time. We'll let EMS take over, but don't lay them flat. Don't lay them, lay them flat. That could kill them, um, even if the rescue was somewhat prompt. If you laid them flat, it, again, that could kill them as well. All right. We've already talked about inspection of equipment. And let's make sure we covered all your comments. I think I think we have. So let's go to the next slide. Now, years ago, um, body belts used to be allowed for fall uh, arrest, fall arrest system. Now, can you imagine a person falling off the side of a building with a body belt on? This is not a harness. Uh, what's that body belt going to do to you after a fall if you used it improperly? What would that body belt do to you? Okay, well... I'm going to go ahead and say it. Uh, it's, it's almost like going to cut you in half. You have that much force. It's at your belt line. It's just used for positioning, but you're using it for fall protection. You fall, and if it doesn't break your back from the fall, it's going to do severe organ damage. So do not use body belts for fall protection. Now, if a person has a harness and a body belt on, they can use the, the, the loops on a body belt for positioning like that, that uh, person that was doing steel erection, but not for fall protection at all because the, the body can't take a fall with a body belt. Now, uh, locking type of snap hook. Now, this snap hook in this photo is double locking. Every snap hook you have has to take two actions to open it. Uh, you, can, you cannot press this open. It will not open if you press this side. you you got to press this side and this side to open it. In the old days, just normal snap hooks, uh, a person could twist out on them. So if you have a simple snap hook, if you, if you have an anchor and a snap hook, if you twist that snap hook in a way, if it's not double locking, you can uh, t uh, twist out of your anchor. So in fall protection, only double action devices are allowed. It takes two actions to, to, to get out of that connection. All right. Now, um, other methods of fall protection, uh, a lot of times on, in construction of buildings, you'll see warning lines. There are the perimeter of the, of the, of the exterior of the, of the building, six feet back or more. They have flags on. They keep people from going near the edge. Uh, control access zones where you have uh, flags and lines pulled to pe keep people out of certain areas. Uh, you may have a safety monitor or you may have a fall protection plan, and we'll talk about all of those here in a second. Warning lines. If you have a low slope roof or a flat roof, you can put up warning lines six feet from all edges. So you tell workers when you're on this roof, you can't work uh, beyond those flags. If you go beyond the flags, you're going to have fall protection on and developed by a competent person. Now, if you're in construction, you see this all the time in these buildings going up. You'll see warning lines and flags. And all the specifications for how uh, flags every six feet, and how tight the line has to be, all that's in the standard. Controlled access zones. Now, this is not a picture of a controlled access zone, but that's where they're pulling lines and flags to keep unauthorized people from leading edge work overhead brick, brick laying and precast concrete. Now, uh, that's to keep people out of these areas. Safety monitor. If you have workers on a low slope roof and uh, the roof widths are less than 50 feet, 
you can have a person that's competent. That means they have the authority to stop work and they're qualified to be a safety monitor for the workers on that roof. The roofs have to be small and you can have a safety monitor there. Now, is the, is the safety monitor, even though this is allowed, is the safety monitor always going to be able to keep somebody from falling off? What do you think? Is the safety monitor always going to be able to keep somebody from falling off a roof? They're watching. And I use the word always. Well, the answer is no. Now, that's ideally, the safety monitor is there to warn people to stay away from the edge and to keep people from, uh, from uh, danger zones. But the, and the, and the standard allows it. And they have to be up there watching the workers. They cannot be doing anything else. They cannot be on the telephone. They can't be doing anything else. They've got to be watching those workers, warning them and keeping them away from the edge verbally. Now, they're not going to be able to physically run. If there are a bunch of workers, not going to be able to physically run around and grab people. They're only a monitor. Now, what's bad about this is sometimes those monitors end up being eyewitnesses to a fatality. They've got a safety monitor. They're not doing their job. Somebody goes over the edge, and they're, they're the witness. But you can use safety monitors if you have flat or low slope roofs, and they're less than 50 feet uh, wide. A fall protection plan, plan and what this is, is it has to be for either leading edge, precast concrete, or residential construction. and you're saying there's no way I can protect people from falls. So you put this plan together. You have to be qualified. And, super, and this plan has to be supervised for, by somebody in authority. Um, I don't have a lot of faith in that. Uh, through engineering today, I would just say in most cases, uh, through engineering, there's probably not too many cases where People are doing this work where you cannot protect them from falls. But if, if there's something where they can't be protected, then you have to have a fall protection plan as described here. If you have holes um, in a construction site, the, it needs to be marked like this one says hole. It has to be kept, kept from shifting or sliding. And it needs to mark, be marked whole or cover. Now, a lot of our sites have Hispanic workers. So the whole would be there in English and Spanish. It has to be marked and labeled. And again, kept from shifting around. And it must take, it must be able to support uh, two times the weight of anything on it, like the person, the materials, anything that would walk over it. Okay, the personal fall arrest system. Now we've got we've got anchor, connector, and a harness. Now when you look at the anchorage, uh, some of these anchors like this one are one-time use anchors. So when you buy something, don't buy a one-time use anchor and use it over and over again. If it's not engineered to be used more and more times, I only use it one time. Now this anchor, this simple anchor, is typically put on a peak of a roof. Um, what's a mistake that companies make with these anchors? What's a common mistake? There could be several common mistakes. What about the installation of that anchor? Okay, I'm going to install this anchor on the roof, and I use something instead of something else. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you the answer. Um, if it requires screws, don't use nails. If it lets you to use nails, only use the proper nails. 
but you have to put it on there exactly as prescribed, exactly as engineered. So if it says you have to use a certain type of screw, again, don't use that nails. Also, that anchor point would not be suitable to tie off two workers. So you wouldn't want two workers on that anchor. Uh, this, connect, this connector over here is double action, and this is a harness. Okay, again, is this correct? What's the problem? What is the problem here? And you can make that picture or slide larger if you want to. Well, hopefully y'all can tell me what the problem is by now. Okay. Okay, the ladder, uh, no protection for the workers, the support. Okay, now this ladder's wrong. The ladder's not set right. It's got to be a 75 degree lang angle, properly supported three feet over the edge to, to be able to get off of it. These workers are not wearing fall protection. So when this worker falls, these little boards across here are going to be like speed bumps and it's not going to stop this worker. Okay, good question, Colleen. Uh, those boards, there's a name for those boards and in the, in the, I don't call those chicken boards. Now, uh, there's another, for those, if I have any roofers on, online, there's a proper name for those boards, but it's not chicken boards. Now, you, you do remind me of a chicken ladder. There is a kind of uh, ladder that's called a chicken ladder that lays on the roof. It's designed to go over the peak. It has something that goes across like those boards, uh, and it helps people climb up the roof. It's not technically a ladder. It's called a chicken ladder. It's uh, regulated by the scaffold standard. And uh, but, but like you say, those boards going across reminds me of a chicken ladder, but again, not a chicken ladder. Now that helps roofers do their work, but it's not considered to be fall protection. Okay, Ricky says we call them roof jacks. Okay, a lot of different names for those. Now, what's wrong with this picture? You see anything here? What is wrong? Okay, the ladder is a problem. And there is a trip hazard. And that trip hazard is supposed to be this guy's lifeline for fall protection. His lifeline's not connected to anything. So he's not tied off. So he's not wearing his fall protect. I mean, he's not connected. He's not wearing his fall protection properly, not tied off, and his fall protection has actually introduced a trip hazard. The ladder, the ladder is not set correctly. So what they're doing is climbing this ladder and stepping off to the side. That ladder should be set up here. But a lot of times people are so worried about messing up the gutter that they'll put the ladder over here. Now, if the ladder's at 75 degree angle here, there's not going to be all that much pressure on that gutter. You're just going to end up one time and getting off. So the ladder's wrong. And he's not tied off. Now, here we got that situation again. Now, uh, here's the ladder. Ladder angle's wrong. The ladder's being used improperly. These two guys are up there and they're not tied off. Okay. Now, um, let's say OSHA comes up, takes this picture, and uh, the person on the roof is a homeowner and his brother. They're not, 
They're not, they're not running a business. They're not part of a business. They're just people working there. Or they, if it's the homeowner and his brother, they're not part of a company. That guy just lives there. Can, can OSHA do anything about this? No, that's right. So homeowners, volunteers, homeowners, people like that, they can do all kinds of crazy stuff. But again, um, guy says, no, however, homeowners open to potential liability. Okay, good comment. Sometimes OSHA is the least of your worries. If, if you've got a homeowner, and his, then these are not homeowner and brother. These are contractors. This is a contractor. But um, if you have somebody fall to their death, again, um, OSHA is the least of your worries when you think about potential liability. Okay, Mary says, I seldom see roofers wear fall protection. So if they're working at your home and they fall, would I be responsible? Um, I, well, like Guy said, I would say generally speaking, generally speaking, no, but when you get into a legal matter, who knows? Uh, yeah, well, here's a good rule of thumb, and, and this is me, this is somebody that had a roof replaced on his house like three or four years ago. I had roofers come in. I have a roof, roof, roofing company come in. Uh, roofers, everybody and their brother will put a roof on your house. Lots of people will do it. But the questions I ask are, uh, are you insured? You know, you carry insurance. And um, don't, don't, don't have anybody like the comments here. Don't let anybody work on your don't don't have anybody like the comments here. Don't let anybody work on your house with that if they don't have insurance. Because you can stand all kinds of liability if they don't have insurance. And uh, I had a guy that wanted to quote the roof on my house. Nice guy. And he said, I can't afford the insurance. But I'll just, I'll just write you a note saying that I'll be responsible. I said, no, I'm sorry, we can't do that. So um, anyway, homeowners are typically okay. If, if the homeowner does due diligence, if the people have proper insurance, again, a court case, you never know what's going to happen there. So hopefully you're not going to run into that. Okay, now this guy, again, on the same roof, not tied off. There's all kinds of slack there. If he was, he would fall. He would hit the ground no matter what. This guy is not tied off. You see his D-ring right there. That's a problem. Uh, now, we're really getting dangerous here. Uh, we've got one person here. This in fall protection. He's tied off. There's his lifeline, there's the anchor, and this guy is walking down a steep roof carrying material in his hand. The chance of him slipping, and that looks like a shingle or something there, would be high. Very dangerous. All right. Positioning. Now, um, we talked about positioning systems. If somebody's working against a vertical surface, they can have a positioning lanyard on that would only let them fall two feet. They're going to inspect it. They can connect that to a safety belt or to a additional ring on the harness, like there's a side ring or a front ring. Uh, they can uh, tie off to a positioning device. But don't use positioning for fall protection. Training. Now, employees have to be trained, and uh, you have to provide a written certification of training. Now, when you're providing a training record to a compliance officer, to your insurance company, anybody that's auditing you, the word certification with OSHA means that that training record needs to have what on it? 
What certifies a training record? What certifies the actual record itself? Certification. Signature. That's correct. Now, Mary, you might, your company might put a seal on there, but signature is what OSHA is looking for. It could, and you're going to have, like Angela says, you're going to have additional information on there as prescribed by the standard. So certified training record is one that is signed, has a legal, physical, or electronic signature on there, depending on what kind of system you've got. Now, whenever things change, if they get new equipment, the site's change, you need to retrain, make sure everybody's been trained and provide a training program. Um, if somebody comes up to inspect or audit you, you need to show them what you do to train them. And it, and it shouldn't be just showing them a video. Uh, they need to touch their equipment. They need to know how to inspect it. They need how to wear it. They need to know how to rescue. All of that would be part of your training. Now today, uh, we've talked about fall protection, the, the standard, and applying it to construction and construction sites. And I've got 1127. And unless you have questions or comments, I'm going to go ahead and call that as being the end of the webinar. And I appreciate your time today. And I'll stay on here for a couple of minutes if you need me to. You're welcome. And um, you guys have been great, been very interactive. Uh, enjoy all the comments. Uh, if, you have, if you have time, do a little bit of reading on rescue of people that have fallen with harnesses and look at some of the studies. Um, again, uh, that's life or death. Once they've fallen, that's not the end. It's still life or death, you know, getting them safely down. You're welcome. Again, it's uh, great having everybody today. And I don't appear to be have, getting any more questions or comments. Okay, Mary, uh, the presentation is available on our website, labor.nc.gov. If you go to labor.nc.gov, and you can go in and find our presentation under fall protection, you can find it in there. And if you scroll at the very top of the chat, there's a link there you can click on. It'll take you right to it. If you do that quickly before I log off, you can do that. Otherwise, labor.nc.gov, OSHA presentations, fall protection. Okay, Angela, that's a great question. You can do a uh, speaker request for us to come out. Uh, we can come out and train just like we did today. But the one thing we can't do is we can't train on your equipment, your procedures, uh, your rescue, uh, that needs to be your company You need to, or your employer. You need to do that. But we can come in and do what, what I've done today, but that alone is not site-specific. So in addition to me training, people would have to have a, some additional time with their equipment and uh, pr your procedures. So you can do a request of us online. But again, we won't be able to do it all. You would still have a piece that you would need to do for yourself. You're welcome. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording this webinar. And